Hi, today we have here this M Audio Studio file AV40 speakers for repair. The problem is that there is a constant hum from both speakers, it started suddenly a couple of days ago in the middle of the night, during which there were some lightnings not far away from here, so my first assumption is that it was caused by a transient over voltage. Let me turn them on so you can hear what I'm talking about. You can also notice that there is no change in the hum level when I turn the volume up or down. Other symptom is that there is no playback if we connect an audio source, in this case this MP3 player, and again no change when I turn the volume up or down. This hum is definitely not caused by induction and if you hear carefully, you can probably notice that it's actually the second harmonic of the power line frequency, which I confirmed later by measuring the period of the recorded sound from this clip and it sounds as if there is a high ripple in the DC output of the power supply used to power the amplifier inside. The left speaker box is the one that contains the electronics and now it's time to open it and investigate further. We see that practically everything is mounted on the back plate. The power transformer is on the one side and the main amplifier board is on the other side, with a metal barrier between them, which together with the metal shielding on the transformer should reduce the hum induced in the audio circuit. I have to add here that both the diode bridge and the transformer were warm, which indicates possible short circuit or increased load as a result of a faulty component on the board. Inside the speaker there is also a small board which acts as a connection bridge between the main board and the elements on the front of the speaker. To release it we have to remove the twist tie first. Here we see that the board changed the color as a result of overheating from the components mounted on the top side, which I later found to be two Zener diodes used to provide stabilized voltage needed for the signal conditioning circuitry. There is one more tie here to be removed. Now we can disconnect these connectors and the main board will be almost free for working on it. The dual secondary winding transformer, the diode bridge and the two electrolytic capacitors are clear indicator that this is a dual polarity symmetric power supply which is commonly used for many power amplifier circuits. This is a schematic of a typical dual polarity supply used in many power amplifiers. Now it's time to go to my workbench to investigate the problem further. First I'm going to test the diode bridge. The connector from the secondary of the transformer is still connected to the board and I'm aware that this creates uncertainties in the test or extra steps to confirm if the diode bridge is fully operational or not. Still, if we carefully analyze the measurement results and the schematic of the power supply, one possible explanation of what we see is that this is due to a short circuit in the negative supply branch.
Anyway, I'm going to remove the diode bridge and test it again out of the circuit. The diode bridge is removed and now we can properly test it. The numbers confirm that all the diodes in the bridge are ok. Now I'll attempt to test the capacitors without unsoldering. The one in the positive supply appears to be ok. Now let's measure the other one. Unlike the previous case, here the multimeter shows overload on the display, which again might be due to a short circuit present in this branch. I'll remove the capacitor to measure it out of the circuit properly. The second capacitor appears to be ok. And the continuity test between the power rails and the ground confirms that there is still a short circuit between the negative power rail and the ground. Let's repeat what we found so far before we continue. Obviously there is a high difference between the loads on the positive and the negative rail and both the diode bridge and the suspected capacitor for the negative supply appear to be ok. If we trace the negative power rail, we can see that there are two more components connected to it. One is obviously the power amplifier integrated circuit, through its pins 1 and 6, and the other one should be a bypass capacitor. Next, I'm going to remove the main board from the backplate, so I can get access to these components and find out which one is causing the problem. The main board is removed from the backplate. To be honest, since the beginning I had a suspicion and I was pretty much convinced that the power amplifier integrated circuit is defective and that the short circuit is actually inside of it. On the schematic for this amplifier we can see that the pins 1 and 6 are connected to the negative rail. So first I desoldered these two pins and then all the rest, but the continuity check was still showing that there is a short circuit on the negative rail. There was one more component to be checked, the one that I suspect at least the bypass capacitor.
the continuity test proved that this capacitor was the component that was shorting the negative rail to the ground and causing this problem. Next, I soldered back the integrated circuit and the electrolytic capacitor for the negative supply. Now, if we didn't do that already, it's time to finally ask ourselves one important question here. Why, if there was a short circuit on the power rail, the fuse in the primary of the transformer didn't blow and protected the circuit? I'll give you the answer later. The short circuit on the negative rail caused overheating of the diode bridge and the transformer, so I had to prove if the transformer is giving the correct voltages. Without the load, the transformer should give at least 14 volts on its outputs. But here we'll see that the voltage on one of the secondary coils is much lower, which means that the respective winding is probably partially shorted inside. Also, the current in the primary coil is very large, which leads us to conclusion that the transformer was damaged from the overheating and unfortunately I need to find a replacement. At that point I also decided to buy a new diode bridge as well, because this one was also under stress long enough during the recording of this video and I didn't want to take the risk and repeat everything from the beginning in case if it fails later in the near future. Unfortunately I couldn't find identical transformer, so I bought the closest match, which was this one. The secondary voltages are 1 volt higher than the original, the maximum current is lower, there is no metal shielding and there is no tap for 110 volts input. The higher output voltage wouldn't be a problem because after the rectification the DC voltages would be somewhere at 21-22 volts and that's still far enough from the absolute maximum rating of the DC supply voltage for the TDA7265 amplifier which is plus minus 25 volts. The lower maximum current on the secondary means that I should take care not to drive the amplifier to the full power, which I don't do anyway. However, the absence of the metal shielding will most likely produce more hum at the output, but for that I didn't have a choice. Now it's time to solder the new capacitor and the diode bridge and mount the new transformer to the backplate. From the old transformer I'll keep and reuse only the connector from the secondary. When making repairs in electronics we need to make sure that everything is isolated properly. The secondary voltages are higher, but that's normal for the transformers of this size. The voltage will drop to the nominal value when the load will be connected.
Both the positive and the negative DC voltages are now present and 3 volts below the maximum allowed for the TDA7265 circuit, so the circuit will operate in the safe zone. For some reason the DC voltages at the outputs of the amplifier are not zero and are not even equal. I don't know if this is normal but I believe that the values are low enough and they cannot damage the speakers. Now it's time to reassemble everything. First to fix, properly isolate and review the position of the transformer and then to return the main board to the backplate, solder the connections to the speakers and do the final checks before closing. Before plugging it to the power, I'm going to check the resistance of the primary and confirm that the switch turns the circuit on and off. Don't forget that the new transformer doesn't operate on dual input voltage as the original one, so I also needed to make some changes and rewire the input. As a result of that, the position of the input voltage selector switch makes no difference anymore. And before we plug the speakers to the power, it's time to show you why the fuse in the primary of the transformer didn't blow and protected the circuit properly. I'm not the first owner of these speakers and for some reason someone in the past decided to put 10 amps fuse instead of 500 milliamps fuse. I believe that if a correct fuse was in use, it would have broken the circuit immediately after the bypass capacitor failed that night and the diode bridge and the transformer would have been saved from damage. Nevertheless, now let's put a correct fuse and plug the speakers to the power. Of course, we shouldn't forget this important aesthetic detail before we make the final test. Now let's play some music from the YouTube library. I hope that you learned something new from this video. Thank you for watching and goodbye.